is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode interview where every single week we interview top entrepreneurs and just straight up top badasses that they're dominating their spaces or people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big epic lives for themselves and their families. So today, you guys, we've got a very special guest on the show, entrepreneur, author, speaker, um, a, a, a technology futurist, um, and, and something that I think a message that we all need to be hearing so heavily today because as, as we all know, technology is changing on such a fast rate. Um, we need to know how we can stay uh, um, ahead of it, if you will, without becoming extinct. So uh, really stoked and honored to have Nicholas Webb on the show. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I'm really excited to have you on the show. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, um, I'm a, you know, techie, if you will, myself, and you know, I'm always trying to study trends and and there's so much information out there with it, and it becomes so difficult to stay on top of it. So, you know, just really excited to have you on the show. Um, but before we jump in and talk about, you know, what you're doing today and your new book and all that great stuff that you have going on, you know, I'm really interested in rewinding the clocks and, and learning what got you into this space in the first place. Like, what got you into entrepreneurship in this space, whether it looks like high school, college? I mean, what, what, what led to this path? Well, you know, I... Um I have always sort of uh, been interested in sort of tinkering around, um, but I think that what really got me is, you know, like a lot of successful entrepreneurs and innovators, um, you know, I sort of see the world more orthogonal, right? I don't see things really the same way that a lot of other people see it, which doesn't make me for a very good employee, right? In fact, I don't think I'm employable. I haven't had a job in 35 years, so I can't even imagine how anybody could ever hire me, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so. I started my career, uh, I was a lifeguard in San Luis Obispo and a friend of mine had this great opportunity to work at Star Surgical, and, uh, which was the first company to make microsurgical implants for dry eye syndrome, and, or, I'm sorry, microsurgical implants for uh, cataract surgery. And I just fell in love with it. You know, we, the, the instrumentation was interesting to me. The science was interesting. Uh, one thing led to another. I invented a range of technologies that became very popular. I sold the company that I built. Uh, for a lot of money for a young guy in his early 20s and I decided that's what I'm going to do the rest of my life and I think I'm up to 45 issued patents. I probably have another 10 patents pending and we just launched a new project called the Destruction Lab where we're actually going into industries looking for ways to destroy bad models and replace them with new technologies and, and customer experiences. So it was kind of a weird circuitous path but um, it worked out pretty good. Yeah, no, I love that. So going back to that first venture, so so you 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 have your you know your your I guess job, if you will, that inspired you to um, create your first company. And I know you talk a lot about this uh, on your on your website as well. But you got so many businesses uh, um, that just don't make it, right? So many patents that are filed, people that aren't making it. Um, how did you know at such a young age? Um, you know, how did you connect the dots to know that you were going down the right path and to have success with your first venture? Well, I think that, you know, for whatever reason, I developed the discipline of fail and fix and try and win, fail and fix and try and win. And that's kind of the mantra. I wrote a book um, a few years ago called Invent Stuff. And boy, I wish I would have known then what I know now about the mistakes I made. Um, I just knew that I didn't want to make other people wealthy. I wanted to, I wanted to be in charge of my own destiny. I always looked at a job as being far more risky than me being in control of my own destiny. Uh, yet many people don't see it that way, and it's that's that's alarm. I, I don't know. I, that seems confusing to me. I I I know that if I'm driving this vehicle, I'm going to get where I want to go safely, and I don't I don't want to trust that some employer is going to deliver something to me. And I also wanted to maximize, you know, my intellect and make the most amount of money on. I call it R O N, return on Nick. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's one of my big was one of my big goals. So look, I I. Um, developed a tremendous ability to take a lot of um, body blows and get up and dust myself off. I learned early on in my career that failure is the fuel, fueling force of all success. And um, so I looked at, I looked at failure as, a, as a, an information gathering process rather than the end all and be all. I, I can remember launching uh, about 18 years ago, an inflatable fitness device, one of my one of my patents, and the product was amazing. I mean, it it was designed beautifully. I had great research from the Orthopedic Research Institute. We had fitness uh, uh, we had fitness experts tell us that yeah, this was the best way to excite the abdominal muscles without damaging and injuring the back. 
everything was perfect. And I can remember that day. It was a, it was a Sunday, and, uh, and I was out by my pool, and my, at that time, five-year-old daughter was swimming. And uh, the phone rang, and my wife kind of handed it to me in a very somber way because we had just tested our direct response advertisement. And I can remember David on the other end saying, hey, Nick, uh, it was a complete dud. And I go, well, let's just test it again. We'll re-. He goes, no, nah, it's, 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 it's not resuscitatable. It's not going to be. And I remember that moment losing a half a million dollars and looking at my daughter's face, who was counting on me for her college education, and thinking, what have I done? Uh, I could have gone in a lot of different directions. And I've had many of those failures. And I could have gone one way or the other. These are what Grove refers to as strategic inflection points. And at that strategic inflection point, I realized that this was just a process of gaining insights that would allow me to go to my next level of success. Within a year, I made that money up many times over. I've referenced the lessons from that experience so many times in my life. It turned out that that half a million dollar failure was worth millions of dollars to me in the lessons that I learned. So I think the real takeaway for a beginning entrepreneur is to realize that the fueling force of success is failure. The goal is to try to not make those failures catastrophic and to realize that unless you die, you're going to be able to move to the next step, right? And, and, uh, and so you just have to bring stuff into perspective. And look, it's been awesome. I mean, I, I've uh, been involved in so many incredible ventures and met so many incredible people. I, I just got back from, a, from I think, a 17-city tour traveling all the around, around the world. Just got back from Australia a few days ago. Uh, meeting amazing people, addressing awesome audiences. Uh, my book, uh, uh, What uh, Customers Crave, is now a number one bestseller. Uh, life is good, and you only get to earn that goodness when you're willing to lean into the risk that it takes to succeed. Yeah, you know, it's it's like the the when they've done the research in hospice uh, units, and they, and they find that the number one regret on uh, people's deathbed is <clears throat> not living the life that they wanted out of fear of being rejected and criticized by others. And it's this weird thing that society makes failure look so bad and so negative when really it's a thing that we're, you know, afraid of that, that catapults our success. Um, but most people can never get above that, that fear to ever go out there and try. Now, did you, you know, growing up, were you in an environment where you were encouraged to go out there and kind of fail forward, if you will? Or was it just studying, you know, some of the people that you were attracted to as, as a younger, you know, kid and entrepreneur that g- gave you that sense of, of no fear of failure? Yeah. Well, I have a couple of books I'm working on. One of the books I'm working on right now is called Stupidicity. And stupidicity is really, I think, the secret to success. Um, my, I have an identical twin brother who is, you know, also a very successful multimillionaire. And uh, he and I both, my identical twin brother and I, were, were diagnosed as being educationally handicapped when we were in uh, eighth grade. Now, um, my brother and I, you know, obviously are reasonably intelligent guys. And, and uh, the problem was is that school just didn't really interest us much. But once an adult tells you that you're educationally handicapped, you sort of lose this uh, fear of looking stupid. And I thought, gee, you know, if I no longer fear looking stupid, think about the amazing opportunities that lay before me. I mean, I'm literally writing an entire book around that simple message. You know, for an example, speaking, I, I address massive audiences. I do 75 keynote addresses to the most prestigious audiences in the world every year. Think about how scary that is when you walk up on the stage and you look out at the sea of people, right? And it turns out that one of the number one human fears is the fear of public speaking. It turns out the number one fear for most people not to go out and live their life uh, and, and live their dreams is the fear, they say, of failure. But you know what? It turns out that most people's biggest fear is the fear that they're going to do something that they're going to look stupid for doing. The biggest fear of speaking isn't the fear of speaking. Nobody's ever spontaneously combusted on a combusted on a web on a stage that I'm aware of. What they're afraid of is looking stupid on a wholesale basis to a lot of people. And 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 would-be entrepreneurs lose the incredible opportunity to live a life of meaning because they're afraid that they're going to fail. And, and as a result of that failure, look stupid. So I think, as crazy as it sounds, and as arcane as it may sound, 
the biggest risk is our need to our, our biggest need I should say is our need to really lean into the fact that failure is cool right I mean I live in the towards the Bay Area here some of the biggest belly flops are famous and they're awesome in fact some of the coolest people I've ever met are just doing stuff that they, that makes I met a guy last week in in Chicago uh, his name is Keller and he's the CEO of a company called um, Zipline and Zipline makes flying robots that delivers blood to remote villages in Rwanda. What? Who would do that? I mean, if you were to, if someone were to come up to me and you and say, "Hey, guys, look, would you like to invest in the flying robot business that's going to save thousands of lives?" We would tell him he's nuts. But Keller is cool. I mean, he's one of the co- he's one of the cool kids for sure. And he said, "I don't care. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm a Harvard trained bioengineer." I know what I'm doing and I want to do something cool. So he created this ridiculous company called Zipline and you know what? They saved thousands of life, lives last year using drone technologies to fly blood and drugs and plasma around Rwanda in an area where there wasn't passable roads. So that's a good example is that he told me, I don't, you know, I, I realize this seems nuts. I'm not even sure what it ultimately means as we scale this. But I'm willing to do something that looks stupid because I want the, this opportunity. And I, I find that in every entrepreneur I've ever met. Yeah, and yeah, you get that, that successful um, commonality where it's like, hey, I might die rich, I may die broke, but I'm not dying average or mediocre and not chasing my dreams and passions. What go. kind of advice do you give, though? Because people might be you know, listening to this right now, listening to you and seeing that you're very successful and saying this as most successful people talk about failure in a positive way. Um, but they they still are struggling massively. Like, oh man, if I fail, what are my in-laws going to think of me? And, and this and this and this. Like, where does somebody even start beginning to overcome that fear? Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that I do with my corporate clients is we do an activity called future casting. You know, draw, do some future casting activity with yourself. You know, take a look at what's, if you stay on the path you're in right now, what really, honestly, does your life look like five years and 10 years from now? You know, Les Brown, uh, the famous motivational speaker, once said that uh, they wanted, he wanted them to inscribe on his tombstone, here lies Les Brown, he was all used up. And I think every great entrepreneur will tell you that it's about not dying with your magic in you. You gotta be willing to ask yourself that philosophical question, is this life worth living with meaning? Or is my only purpose in life is to be a wage earner and to live a life of mediocrity? You got to decide. And one of the beauties is, is that, you know, human, human psychodynamics suggests that we move away from pain and we move towards pleasure. We've got to change that, that natural intuitive mindset to move, to feel comfort in risk and, dis, and discomfort in the status quo. And it's, and it's a mind game. You have to constantly, you know, I, I like to do mind mapping. I use mind mapping software to, to start to explode. What does my life look like? You know, I made a decision. I mean, I've, I've been a professional speaker for some years, but I decided that I wanted some new interesting adventures. Just the last few months, I've been to Paris. I've been to London. I've been to Bordeaux, France. I've been to Dubai. I've been to Sydney, Australia. I've been to every major beautiful city in this country in just the last few months. I made a decision to do it. And I did it. And you know what? I found something. This is true with innovation. The number one reason that people fail, the number one reason is they never actually pull out of their driveway. And you got to make a decision, you know, am I willing to pull out of my driveway? You know, if you take a look at it from a risk perspective, if I decide to go get a carton of milk right now, according to the Department of Transportation Safety data, I have a significantly greater chance of being involved in a serious or even fatal car accident within three miles of my home. If I actually make it inside the grocery store and get a court carton of milk, according to the American Dietetic Association, I significantly increase my, my chances of sudden death as a result of arteriosclerotic heart disease, right? And I could go on and on and on. The question is, do we focus on the risk or do we focus on the deliciousness of the opportunity? We move towards what we think about most often, according to Dr. Dennis Wadley. In fact, race car drivers know when they start to learn to ride, right, I just got the great honor of speaking for billionaire uh, Bruce Pinsky at P- Pinsky Racing in Scottsdale two weeks ago. And the one thing from talking to these professional race car drivers is, you know, if you don't want to run into the wall, never look at the wall. 
Yet most people wake up every day and they look at the bad things that could happen and they, they, they navigate to that. You have to start creating visual imagery and, and developing processes and a plan around what that delicious future looks like and stop focusing on what can potentially go wrong. And actually, you know, some of the biggest belly flops I had were the most exciting. That's when we feel life, right? When we're getting beat up. And, uh, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change any of the failures that I've had in my career for anything. Yeah, love it. So um, when, when, you were at the, when you sold your first company, I mean, you're at a young age, making a lot of money, um, you know, because I'm sure at that point you probably could have just invested it in, in, in you know, the standard wise way, if you will, or, or, um, and just been set, you know, right? Like what, what personally kept you driving um, at that age uh, to, to not just get comfortable and keep going out there and chasing greatness? You know, um, I will say, never give a 23-year-old millions of dollars, right? <laughs> it turns out <laughs> it's a, it's, uh, it requires adult supervision, right? So I pissed away a good part of that early on, but I had a super good time doing it, <laughs> right? So I remember how cool it was to make a lot of money, and I also remember how fun it was to waste it, and I wanted to do that some more. And I was obsessed with doing that some more, so I did. Yeah. And so, you know, look, a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of people could have easily said, Nick, if you would have invested that money, you would have never had to work again. And not working again would have been tragic for me. I mean, you know, they say that the best definition of happiness is that happiness is the process of obtaining a meaningful purpose. The overwhelming majority of people, especially wage earners, are not living a life that's meaningful. And because of that, they are not living a life that's happy. The other success component or the happiness component that most people are missing is the opportunity is is that is hope, right? Like I know every day when I come into my office, I can just about decide how much money I want to make. I mean, I don't have I don't have a limit. I'm I'm not gonna go to my boss and say I'd like a thousand dollar a week bonus. I can actually come into my business and say, I've got a great idea for a new venture and and I believe it can make three million dollars. I'm gonna do that. And and the but it's the same amount of, you know what I mean? It's It may not, but then again, it might. And just being involved in the process of creating that new venture is so exciting. You know, it really is. We I filed, I think, seven patents in the last eight weeks. Um, we've already got a, a company right now we're having a call, a call with tomorrow that wants to put a half million dollars into one of our, our projects. And I'm not even interested. It's it's I don't want to sell it. It's too good. And and so, I don't know. I, I I think the real takeaway here is that most people way underestimate what it takes to be a millionaire. They way underestimate what it takes to be success, successful at some levels. Now, you could argue that the opposite's true. But I don't think so. When they compare it to the pain of living a life that's doled out to them by an employer versus the, the, the poetry of having the opportunity to really write your own paycheck, that's what drives me. I'm not sure if it does other entrepreneurs, but that's certainly what drives me. So then once you got clarity on this, because, you know, we, we, we find um, for a lot of entrepreneurs, and I, I get this question a lot in the podcast, and I bet, you know, I think we all go through this at some point, at least I know I have, uh, of you, you, you get clear on what you want in this world. You get clear on what your passion, what drives you, and you start that leveling up journey. Um, but those that are maybe, you know, that you've grown up with, your family members, your closest friends, um, they may not understand that, grasp that, not leveling up the same path with you. Um, you know, how do you, how do you, um, overcome that if you will? Cause it's, it gets hard where, you know, a lot of times that circle is, they don't grasp it. They don't understand it. They're not speaking the same language and it can, you know, hold you back if you will. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I can remember taking criminology in college and, um, I, I can remember that one of the biggest problems with uh, criminals is that they tend to be recidivists, meaning that they do the same thing over and over again, despite the fact that doing that same thing over and over again was really life destructive to them. And so the question is, it's a societal and maybe a psychological question is, is that how do we change human behaviors? Because that's really the, the genesis of, of success. Uh, you know, think of, look at it from a fitness perspective. You know, out of the people that sign up for a gym to get fit in January 1st, only about 5%, depending on whose numbers you look at, only about 5% are still going to the gym in March. So I'm saying 5% of the people who endeavor this are still going to the gym in March. And out of the 5% that are going to the, to the gym in March, 
only a small fraction of the ones that are actually in the gym are actually really working out, right? So you have to show up, you have to sign up, and then you have to stand up. And that's the three things that's required for fitness, and it's the three things that are required for entrepreneurial success. Putting together a website, deciding you're going to go down this road, that's cool, but if you're statistically like most individuals and entrepreneurs, by the time March rolls around, you're not doing it anymore. So you have to look at associating pain with things that are the status quo in your life, like being a wage earner, not making enough money, not driving the car that you want to drive, not wearing the Rolex watch that you want to wear, not doing the things. You, you have to associate pain with that and then associate pleasure with those things that you want to have. And I know this sounds cosmic and whatever, but this is actually a proven psychological fact that when we can focus on the things that we want, we tend to have a higher degree of, of consciousness about the kinds of things that we need to bring into play to make those things a reality. That's been my secret. I focus on w the benefits of my 12, 12 hour days. I focus on the benefits of the kinds of risks that I'm going to take in order to have a chance at something. I don't know, for some reason, most of the time it works out. Yeah, no, I love it. Yeah, manifestation on, on that stuff is so powerful. Do you have a, um, like some type of a daily routine that you go through where you, could, you just sit there and visualize and manifest on those things that you want? I do. In fact, um, I am extremely judicious about my planning process. So at the, at, I do a three-month personal plan and a three-month professional plan. And in there, I essentially do a gap analysis. I say, this is what I want. I want to be fit. Like right now, I'm on a fitness roll. I'm rolling out of three months of living on the road, which is really hard to stay in shape. So I'm on a, a major fitness roll right now. And so I've had to put a list of the things that I'm not going to do and the things that I'm going to do. And then I look at those in the morning and then I do a quality assurance check at the end of the day. Did you consume the right foods? Did you do the exercise? Did you do this? When you have a daily accountability to where you catalog those things, it's incredible how fast that changes your behavior. Look, every one of us has only one thing that is making the difference between super success and failure. In fact, in my book, Breakers, Leading uh, a Destruction in the Innovation Economy, in that book, I talk about what is the difference between superstars that are really, really successful and live a great life and people that live a life of mediocrity. The only difference is it isn't intelligence, it isn't education. In fact, statistically, the overwhelming majority of uh, A students are working for C and D students, right? That's a fact. There isn't a direct corollary in an innovation-driven economy anymore about education. It's not about who you know. It's not about luck. It's not about anything other than developing a set of systems that puts you in the direction of the goal that you want to obtain. I do that, but one of the things we know in our corporate consulting practice, we do a thing called executive dashboards. And in those executive dashboards, hour by hour, day by day, executives are able to look at revenue, cost, productivity uh, issues. There's a series of eight dashboards, just like on your car. And by seeing those in real time, they're able to instantly make course correction and it allows them to accelerate returns on, on strategic investments and, and, uh, and strategies in general. On a personal level, you can do the same thing. Just simply put together a plan that, that and, and I do it on a power, one single PowerPoint slide, and I put together the different aspects of what personal means to me, because these have to be customized. And then I say what I'm going to achieve in a day, in a week, and in a month, and I look at it every single day. And it's that biofeedback between what I've committed to do and what I'm doing every day that shows and proves to my, to my subconscious mind that I'm moving down a product, productive pathway. It just always works. Yeah, no, I love it. So um, the, the Destructive Lab, um, did, you know, walk us through how that came about. Was it just after creating so many businesses, you just kind of found these commonalities of, of that just kind of apply to every industry out there that, that led yeah. you down that path? Yeah. I have been talking about, uh, you know, there's this popular term now called disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation suggests that, you know, innovators are out there disrupt, disrupting certain markets. You know, for an example, Uber. Uber did not, dis did not really disrupt the cab industry. It destroyed it. Right? And, and that's the stuff I'm interested in. What did they do? They didn't reinvent the cab. They reinvented the human experience. They leveraged digital ubiquity, micro-mobile moments, 
hyper influential social networks and a range of methods that all disruptors use to just make a taxi irrelevant, right? So we're seeing that in every industry. Every industry is being destroyed. There's a new app. I was just at the Vision Expo in Las Vegas. It used to be that if you wanted to go get your eyes checked, you picked up the phone, right? And you talked to a receptionist who was super glad to hear from you, right? Like not. And you took 10 minutes to try to figure out when you could actually get in there. Statistically, on average, it takes seven days to get to see the optometrist. And then on average, it takes two hours to get through a doctor visit. And then the last touch point is they try to sell you expensive contact lens and spectacles. Guess what? That's an app. It's just an app. Now you go on your smartphone, you do an eye exam, and the time that it takes you to set up an appointment, which is half the money and just as accurate, and think about it if you're an optometrist. You've just been replaced by an app. And I have this famous saying that I say now, dude, you're an app. I'll be listening to somebody uh, talking about their business model, and I'm thinking to myself, dude, you're an app. What we're doing with the Destruction Lab is we're going to go out and find these low-hanging fruits, and we've already identified three or four markets that we're going to destroy, leveraging this body of research that works every time. I didn't invent this stuff. I'm just going to apply what Netflix and Uber and, and uh, what Waze and other technologies have done, Lemonade and, and others. I'm going to apply that same methodology to other industries and take advantage of displacing those those businesses. I just spent three years researching a book, What Customers Crave, and it's now the number one best-selling book on marketing. That book was really fun to write, and what I learned by writing What Customers Crave is that it used to be that the wealth was created by entrepreneurs by inventing bright, shiny objects, but today the wealth is about inventing perfect human experiences. That's where the competition is today. So entrepreneurs that learn how to uh, invent across the five touch points, the pre-touch, the first touch, the core touch, the last touch, and the in touch, the ones that learn how to build blended experiences in both digital and non-digital environments, and the entrepreneurs that know how to identify their customers like Apple does by a range of node types, these organizations can disrupt markets. If they're already in a mature market, they can deliver the best service. They're, most organizations have 30% of revenue that they're not getting because they don't understand the way of the superstar CX designer. And in What Customers Crave, I go about that going, I, get, I create a playbook to show companies how to do that. Yeah, I love it. You know, I, I don't know, and I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but I heard somebody recently say that, uh, or predict, that they believe that Walmart will be out of business in 15 years because they can't keep up with Amazon. All the bricks and mortars, Amazon now in Seattle's, your your doorstep in two hours via drone, you know, um, right. different things like that, and and it is scary. I mean, now I mean, bricks and mortar companies are failing daily. You see, I mean, I, you, you you may know the stat. I can't remember the exact stat, but of the, the original Fortune 500 companies, there's only a few left today. You know, yeah. I mean, they were seeing these collapse. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, because our listeners are almost all entrepreneurs on on this show, as an entrepreneur, like what what should you be paying attention to um, to make sure that you're you're not becoming extinct? You're staying with the trends. In my book, What Customers Crave, I, I, I what I've identified is that the best companies, no matter what kind of business you're in, I, I give an example in the book of the Neo Wash. Think about a car wash. Now, I live in California. And I think in California, it's a felony not to have a clean car. I mean, it's just, we just do, right? Uh, because we have sunny days, we have to have, we have, to have a clean car. Uh, car washes are big here. But when you go to a car wash, the experience is typically bad. And it's bad because the car wash hasn't identified the range of personas that it serves. And it also doesn't deliver perfect experiences across the various touch points. So it doesn't matter if you sell cupcakes, if you're a car wash, if you're a restaurant, it doesn't matter what business you are, you can disrupt your market by understanding your customers in a more finite way. For an example, when you go to an Apple store, they do something that they call polite probing. They don't try to sell you anything, they just want to know what you hate and what you love. That persona or that node type tells them exactly how to deliver to you the perfect experience. I'm super busy, I know the Apple product really well. When I get into an Apple store, I want to get my stuff and I want to get out. I'm not lonely, I'm not there to visit, I want out with my stuff. They realize that early on and so they say, hey, download a free app, scan your stuff and bolt. I love them for that. They created a perfect experience for me. My wife, on the other hand, is very nurturing, very loving. She likes to spend a lot of time talking and so on. Time is not an issue with her and she would actually rather somebody spend time with her. They, sit, they identify that she's a nurturing node type and they set her down at the Genius Bar and they live with her for a while and at the end of that experience, she buys tons of stuff. 
this body of work about identifying customers based on what they hate and what they love, not market demography, but what they hate and what they love, and then inventing better human experiences is the weaponization of the best entrepreneurs on the planet. It's not about the bright, shiny object. It's not about your business model. It's about how you can invent the best, perfect human experiences. Those are the organizations. I looked at 4,000 companies, interviewed 2,000 people for that book. The companies that are killing it, like In-N-Out Burger and Trader Joe's and Zoya and Mac Cosmetics, and the list goes on and on. Those companies get it and they're killing it in the marketplace. The good news is you don't have to be rich to do this stuff. You just have to know how to do it. And so I created that playbook so people could figure out how to apply this to their business and make a lot of money. Yeah, no, I love it. So if you are, um, let's say, a uh, you know, small HVAC company, you know, right? HVAC company, and they got a you know, couple employees, and you know, maybe they're making hundred grand a year net. They don't, they don't have a lot of money to do a lot of research. And I know this is discussed deeply in your book, and, and we'll definitely those that are watching and listening will have links right to the book. Make sure you go out there and get the book right away. Um, um, but how, how can somebody maybe do some of that due diligence and research? in an affordable fashion? Well, one of the most conspicuous ones, so let's just take a look at, at uh, let's assume that this HVAC mm -hmm. company has competition and that, this, that the business is being diced up across a range of competitors in the market they serve. Let's assume that. It's probably the case. So the question is, is where, how do customers find you? Well, if you're looking for a heating or air conditioning solution, 97% of the time, your first pre-touch moment is going to be leveraging digital ubiquity. In other words, you're going to go to your computer or your connected device. And you're going to do that across what Google calls micro mobile moments. So there's two things that have to happen in order for you to gain 30% more revenue instantly. And the two things you have to do is you have to be there and then you have to be relevant. Right Now, relevancy also delivers gratuitous value. So in other words, when somebody's searching for you, they find you, and you're delivering the six things that every homeowner needs to know before they make an investment into air conditioning or heating. Right? There needs to be a 180-page download book, The Homeowner's Guide to Air Conditioning. Is that what HVAC is? My yeah, 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 yeah. So, right? So what we find is, I mean, Jay Bear wrote a great book, Utility, that talks about content marketing, but we need to go way beyond content marketing. Your digital properties need to be value dispensers. You need to own the free stuff so that when customers are in the research phase, that you are not going to be the victim of digital deflection. I would guarantee if I went into the average HVAC back business in my town, I would found, find 30% new revenue opportunities by changing and in fixing and creating what we call the pre-touch moment. The problem with the pre-touch moment is it's hard to know exactly what the deal is with pre-touch because they're pre-touch. They haven't picked up the phone to call you. You have no data to determine what they're up to from a digital behavioral perspective, but guaranteed 97% of the time, local searches for heating and air conditioning are going to happen as a digital micro moment. How you architect delicious experiences digitally is going to make the difference. Now, the other thing you have to do is you have to be really, really, really good at customer service so that those first touch and those core moments are so exceptional that those customers are rating you on Yelp and Google and any other hyper influential social community to make sure that you're delivering the kind of value that uh, is it's going to turn them from advocates to advocates, right? We want those people to really advocate for us. We know that hyper influential social ratings like Yelp and like Google ratings and others can determine 15 to 20 percent of your top in earnings. So that means you can go from bankrupt from from bankruptcy to profitability or from profitability to bankruptcy based on what an influential community says about you because of the impact on how people see social ratings. Give you a good, a good example. I happen to be an author, right? My, my books are rated by people that either love them or hate them. If my if I write bad books and I've done that before. I wrote a book that I finally had to take off off because it was just horrible. And what it taught me was, don't write bad books, right? And when I finally did that, I wrote books that were more thoughtful and respected my reader more. 
and as a result, they have to like them and because they like them, more people buy books. That's the secret, right? So if I were in that business, I would start with my pre-touch. Then I would look at that first touch moment. What does it look like when they reach out to you? How do you set the trajectory of that experience? And then the core experience, how awesome are you to deal with? Right, and I can I can walk you through what that journey would be like. Right, you go online, you type in air conditioning, you know, San Francisco, California, and these things come up, and you see the ten things you must know before buying an air conditioning. I'm not going on any click ads on pay per clicks. I'm going to that that post, and I'm going to read that checklist before I even go any farther. Oh, by the way, that checklist resides on a HVAC company, right? And then I'm going to call them. And when I call them, there's going, they're going to answer the phone before three rings. And when they do, it's going to be buoyant and friendly and personable. They don't put me on hold. And they say, hey, tell us what's going on. Oh, my God, really? We personalized the discussion. Wow, I had that happen. My sister, in fact, just lost her air conditioning last week. I know, Not making it some robotic, but making it a human connection on that first touch point. Because we know that the first touch point determines the trajectory of that relationship. The things that you leave them with, you know, what does that person leave them with? Hey, by the way... I want to leave you with this special gift. This is a home monitoring technology, $50, that you plug in and it monitors the humidity and the health of your home. I just wanted to give this to you as a gift to thank you for choosing us. You remember that forever. That's the last touch point. And then the in touch moment, how you're staying in touch with them all the time, not to sell them stuff, but to deliver beautiful value to that customer. That's what it looks like. You do that stuff, you own your market, and I don't care what business you're in. Yeah, and it seems like it's almost easier more so today because that personal touch is gone in almost every yeah. industry, you know, and it, it just the human connection elements just seem to disappear and, and it becomes so powerful. Now, do you have recommendations for, um, you know, how, how to really wear a consumer hat, if you will, as your entrepreneur of, you know, utilizing all your consumer experiences with industries way outside your own industry and taking those great experiences to yours? I'm not sure I completely understand. So, your like, okay, like, um, if I'm at the Apple Store, right? So, you talked about the Apple Store. One of the companies that I own is is a residential real estate company in Phoenix, Arizona. So, I'm at the Apple Store. You know, going there as a consumer, but analyzing that experience uh, on how to learn that and take those those maybe back to my real estate company, even though it's a totally different industry, and apply those. I mean, are you? You know, do you always have your consumer hat on, even if it's in different spaces that then you're involved in, just to learn those techniques? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was actually Steve Jobs himself that said the ultimate form of genius is is being good at copying things, right? Um, look, I, I think that there is some of that. The one thing I learned in researching, like one of the companies that surprised me was um, Safe Light Auto Glass. You know, Auto Glass? I mean, how can that be an interesting company to even look at? But I had the opportunity to interview their CEO, Tom, and that company is just, they are superstars. They're, they have just nailed it, right? And, and you can see where they have borrowed probably a lot of experiences from a lot of different great companies and brought that in in its own unique and special way into Autoglass. Um, so, yeah, I think you can borrow stuff, but you got to be careful about being a replicator instead of an innovator. Um, there are unique and special things about the customers that you serve and gaining those insights and then creating custom innovations, customer experience innovations that are very, very granular and specific across your range of customer types is critical. For an example, going back to your, your HVAC, uh, you know, well, first of all, the experience of, cons of consuming a air conditioning or heater is very different than consuming a branded product like Apple. Right, so some of the stuff doesn't honestly apply, and that's the problem with this. People want a template. We had somebody call us this morning asking. We, I have a company called Crave, C R A V V E, and Crave the, provides this kind of services for large companies. And they said, "Look, we want to know if you could just uh, you know drop one of your templates in here and get a sign." No, there's no such thing as a template. Um, if you're looking for templates, you come to the wrong place. I mean, I don't know how to do that. I wish I. It would be so cool and so scalable just to give somebody a generic plan, but. You know, an HVAC consumer in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, is going to be very, very different. It's very regional. The kind of uh, customer you serve in, in Phoenix proper is going to be very different than somebody that you serve in Scottsdale and somebody that you're going to serve in, in Paradise, right? Um, all these people are Tempe or Mesa or you name the city. I mean, they're all different demography. They have different economic wherewithal. Uh, they may even have different challenges. And so um, what we recommend is to do the heavy lifting of really thinking about the kinds of people that you serve and then building out a persona around that customer type. And it's not based on demography. It's based on 
you know, uh, let's say that you've got a 65 plus buyer in Scottsdale that calls your HVAC company, there's a good chance that they're risk centric, that they, they are suspect of being ripped off. Uh, that's probably a safe, safe assumption about that particular node type. What else do we know about them? Well, they may be living on somewhat, even though they're in Scottsdale, they may have somewhat of a, of a fixed income. Uh, so there could be price sensitivity. What does that look like? How can we address that? So again, you just have to get really, really granular. You can copy some of it. Um, but for the most part, you know, to do it right, it's, it's really much, very much a one-off process. So what, what led you to, to wanting to write this new book? You know, I mean, obviously you've had all these experiences and, and um, you know, because I mean, I know you operate from a place of abundance, but now you're kind of teaching your competition what makes you successful in your other businesses, your own playbook. You know, what, yeah. what, what inspired you to write this book? Well, you know, I have spent my entire career, I invented my first surgical scalpel 28 years ago. Um, and so, you know, I've been inventing for over three decades and I've gotten really good at creating, you know, bright, shiny objects. And it's been really, really fun because typically products, bright, shiny objects are what deliver value to customers. But then I began to realize, you know, when I started watching things like Waze and Netflix and Lemonade and Uber and all these other, begin to realize that the medium, the stuff that we make innovations from have become principally digitized. And they're more about delivering a different human experience across a range of very granular customer types. And so I thought, wow, this is real exciting. So I just got really excited at looking, I think I'm the first person that's done this, to look at customer experience as an innovation design process. It's very much how I wrote the book. And you know, we've applied this to some of the biggest brands in the world and it works with mathematical certainty. So my enthusiasm about this is that it's so cool to meld the combination of innovation with human experience design and, and realize that you've got this huge toy box of tools that you can draw from to create these amazing human experiences. It's just so fun to me. And, 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 and I couldn't resist the temptation. It's really why we put the destruct, Destruction Lab together is I can't resist the temptation because it works so well with my clients to start doing lots of it. We're, we're involved in, well, I, I can't mention much about it, but we're involved in one project that's going to be launching in about four months where we literally are destroying an industry that was, that was, that's been around and very healthy since the 1890s. And the day that they, these apps and, and this uh, website goes live, those businesses will be completely and absolutely 100% totally irrelevant. So if you want to make a lot of money right now, be that disruptive innovator. There's not a lot of money to be made in incremental improvements to stuff that already exists. The real money is in disruption. Yep, love it. So um, speaking of, of, of that and getting people prepped for the new economy, you know, because we uh, a lot of our listeners are millennials, about 85 percent are millennials that are listening right now. You know, there's 2.4 billion millennials where there's not 2.4 billion jobs. Um, how do millennials or even um, like I've got three young kids, uh, eight, six and three. You know, how do we how do we prep them um, and prep ourselves for, for this massively rapidly changing economy? Well, first of all, send me your shipping address because I invented the world's most award-winning educational toy that won Best Product of the Year, Best Toy of the Year, and the Top 10 Award by Dr. Toy. So I, I, there's another company <laughs> that's on your space. <laughs> anyway, uh, look, uh, there's a great book. In fact, uh, it's published by my publisher uh, called The Gig Economy. And, um, you know, we don't look at... Uh, you know, it, it, is a, it is a tremendous opportunity for us today. Millennials need to realize, and I have four millennials as children, and I'm proud to say that I've out-hacked my millennials across the board, and I have very sharp millennial kids. I mean, if you look at my, my studio here, this is, all, this is all 3D printers, digital 3D scanners, you know, you name it, right? We have a full R&D lab here. My kids, my five-year-old used to use a MakerBot Replicator 2 to make cookie cutters for Halloween when she was in kindergarten. Right. So, look, um, what surprises me about many millennials is how techno inept they are. Um, this should be, as digital natives, millennials need to be technological superstars because the toolboxes of success and wealth and opportunity are very much in the form of digital solutions. So you need to make sure that you are an expert in all things digital because that's where the wealth opportunity is. Also, we have to change as millennials 
you know, we need to change the way in which we look at financial opportunities. It's not about jobs anymore. Jobs are, as my 18-year-old daughter would say, lame. You know, what's a job? I mean, that's ridiculous. What you want is a lot of good gigs, right? It's, it really is about the gig economy where we're able to take a skill set and we sell that skill set, uh, especially to, you know, there's this new trend called the stale pale male, the old white guy, right? <laughs> there's a lot of people out there that just don't get it and they need a lot of help. And if millennials can lean into their technological prowess, the opportunity for them to interpret the digital future is unbelievable. But what surprises me as a 58-year-old man is how is it there are so many millennials that have not really developed a level of digital sophistication? And I'm not talking about how to use text. I'm not talking about how to use the functions on your iPhone. I mean, what do you know about you know connection architecture? What do you know about digital disruption? How are you leveraging hyper-influential social communities? What does digital disruption really mean? And how can you learn about that body of knowledge so that you can sell it for a lot of money? That's where the millennial opportunities are. Yeah, and in today's world, you know, with YouTube and and Udemy, for example, I mean, I mean, I'm probably Udemy's biggest client. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm taking every course. I mean, it's it's you got universities at your fingertips for yeah. for next to no money, um, right. with that. Um, so you know, that's a question I get a lot on this show because we we do have a younger audience that listen to the show of, um, you know, hey, I want to become an entrepreneur. Should I go to college? You know, and it's always a tough one to kind of answer. You know, I mean. You know, I, I know college wasn't for me, but it, I mean, to prep yourself, if you're at that point, if you're an 18 year old right now and you could, you were giving them advice or giving yourself at 18 advice, you know, would you go that traditional path or would you go a totally different path? Yeah. So look, I have four kids. I have two, I have a 21 year old that's finishing up uh, at San Diego state. I've got an 18 year old that's just starting uh, JC to kind of figure out where she wants to go, but she'll definitely, she's probably going to go to law school. And then I have a 17-year-old that won't, that does not find uh, high school very interesting. Uh, I would suggest, first of all, that everybody watches um, the number one TED Talk of all time um, called "Does Creativity uh, Does Education Kill Creativity?" by uh, by Sir Robbins, uh, because I think it really tells the story. So there isn't one answer to that question. There's really two. If you uh, like my older daughter would never be able to be an entrepreneur. She's watched me go by and it does not interest her at all. The fact that I am a, I am a bungee jumper every day, I'm willing to put everything in the line to be able to live a life that's interesting and meaningful. My older daughter would never in a million years do that. If you believe that you're going to work for a company or if you believe that you're going to need to secure a professional credential, so if you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a CPA, there are certain areas that require that you get a college degree to check that box in order to enter into that space. So if you're that person, college is absolutely required. If you are a person that uh, doesn't enjoy school and you think it's lame and it uh, bores you and uh, you don't find it relevant, don't waste your time. I mean, I, I know this is very controversial. I just had this discussion with my 17-year-old son and I'm thinking, boy, it doesn't feel very intuitive for me to say, Chase, don't go to school. Chase has been a day, a day trader for two years. He's getting ready to start a, he has designed some skateboard products and he's getting ready to do a Kickstarter project. He's that guy. And, and I think he'd be, I think, I think he would lose his IQ by going to college. You know, it's funny for me, I, I, I uh, was, I never went to, uh, I think I did a year of high school. I luckily was able under a special scenario to go to college. I spent three years in college and then dropped out to go to work at Star Surgical. When I look back, the three years I spent in college, all they did is, you know, teach me beer pong. I, I did nothing to me at all, nothing. Um, and, and, and um, you know, ironically, just a few months ago, I was honored with my doctorate degree in humane letters from a prestigious medical school, gave me a doctor's degree. Uh, and that was cool because it's nice to be Dr. Nicholas Webb, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, success is about delivering value to others. And this is, again, another millennial problem. You know, uh, there, the, the free stuff didn't work out so well. A lot of the structures that were designed to be able to make it possible for us to do our art, you can do all that stuff. But just remember that if you want to be an artist, it may not have a commercial pathway, and that's okay. I mean, I, if my son has a good time tinkering around and doing cool stuff with his life that's meaningful, I don't care if he becomes a millionaire. I really don't. 
I think being a millionaire is overrated. I mean, to Tim Ferriss's point in the four hour work week, it's not about being a millionaire. It's about living like a millionaire, as he calls it, the NR. If you want to be the new rich, live a life that's cool. Like people talk to me, they go, what? You win where? You did what? You what? You know, it's that to me is a meaningful life. When you've got the huevos to go out there and do stuff that most people would never dream of. I think that's exciting. Yeah, and in today's world, I mean, you can you can become that laptop millionaire if you will, will if yeah. you if you develop those right skill sets and and be making money anywhere. Just well, you're living proof of that, right? So, um, um, if you could recommend our listeners to start developing, you know, maybe two or three skill sets, you know, right to to prep them because I mean I mean you're a futurist. And there's a lot of there's a lot of I don't want to say scary, but different pathways that you can take of of you know, um, that it will go with AI and different things. Um, you know, prep us for the next 30, 40, 50 years, what this looks like. If there was a few skill sets people could start learning right now to prep themselves for what may come, what would that be? So I think, you know, going back to, I think it was Zig Ziller, Ziglar said that uh, the only way to make your dreams come true is to be good at making other people's dreams come true. It turns out in the reciprocal universe that we live in, the way you get wealthy, the way you live a life of meaning is to be able to help somebody else, right? And that's not about you know volunteering necessarily, although that's great. It's about developing the wherewithal to deliver value to others. So the first thing you have to do is you have to realize that most of everything, there are four big future shifts that are gonna happen. Number one is hyper-consumerization. Everything is becoming consumerized, meaning that consumers have unlimited choices. They can buy just about anything, anywhere, for almost any in any quality at any price, any time, right? So hyper-consumerization provides an opportunity for entrepreneurs to find the ability to provide unique and special value to a consumerized customer. The second thing is economic shifts. There's a decentralization of economic opportunities. We're going to see big, big company opportunities shrink down into regionalized opportunities where we can create businesses that go to a, to a very, very specific market universe. Lemonade is one of my favorites. Lemonade is a P2P insurance company that was a bunch of people that got together and says, look, renter's insurance is too expensive. Let's provide renter's insurance in an affordable way and let's donate some of our pro proceeds to charity. Let's do some cool stuff. And they did and it's a tremendous success and it's displacing large insurance companies. Those are the kind of opportunities that are really, really cool. So consumerization, new economic models, which are really happening through decentralization. The other issue is Tech, enabling technologies, Be, you know, sign up for CNET. Look, go to the, you know, go to your favorite technology website, DeJour, every day. Do Google alerts on latest technology. Read every morning for the first 15 minutes on what is coming next. What you need to think about in terms of these emerging enabling technologies. And then lastly, the other trend is disruption. We need to be disruptive innovators. The, the, the days of being an HVAC company that just fixes air conditioning is so not there anymore. The, those markets will be disrupted by an AC app. You press the app, everything you want happens immediately, predictably, and it's verified through an influential network of raters. Those are the kind of things that are going to change those spaces. So look at in those the, that disruption, not incremental improvements. There's no wealth there. The wealth Wealth is in major changes, and that means sometimes destroying or displacing existing products and technologies. Yep, love it. So um, I got to ask just just on a selfish front, um, uh, one of the spaces that I'm looking at getting back involved in. I grew up in this space, but it's been 12 years since I've I've been in the space. But it is in the fitness industry, and, and I know you're you're really into fitness, and you talked about it a few times. Um, you know, what are some ways that you feel the fitness industry, bricks and mortar health clubs, right? I mean, it's it's actually in the Bay Area, the, the facility that we're looking at acquiring right now. Um, you know, what are some things that you see in that space that that an owner can go because that's a kind of a dinosaur broken old model. It is. Well, you know, I think that the real opportunity is creating sustained value. I'm seeing some interesting stuff in that space where, you know, personalization and customization of fitness and health is a big deal. Look, if you take a look at healthcare, we have gone, we were in a treatment centric industry where it was about treatment, you know, diagnosis, and treatment. The future, especially under the new economic models of healthcare, and I speak a lot on this subject, I know it well, is that it's going to be about anticipating health conditions and preventing health conditions. 70 to 80% of every dime that's spent on healthcare today, get this, 70 to 80% is caused from a new disease we call lifestyle disease. 
And lifestyle disease is where we eat our way, drink our way, smoke our way, and set our way into chronic illness. You're looking at my office right now. I have a couch there that I set out at the end of the day. All my desks in this office are all standing. I haven't set for six years. That's, you know, this is the kind of things that people are doing. They're looking at ways to make ongoing improvement. So the fitness industry at a gym level, it's about an engineering, human experiences that are perfect, the stuff I talk about in my book. Um, but it's also about leveraging enabling technology to provide ambulatory monitoring as part of it. I think that the clubs that are developing ambulatory monitoring as an adjunct to the on-site fitness stuff, those folks are going to win. Um, we're involved. I just filed a, I just ish got a patent issued on a product that actually leverages a range of fitnesses, fitness routines that work with your wearable technology so you can do a better and more accurate job of monitoring those. But yeah, great space. It's going to continue to get better as we move towards wellness and anticipatory healthcare. And I think you're in good shape, but don't go into it thinking that the old-fashioned model is going to work because it's so not going to. Yeah, love it, love it. So um, where's the best place to uh, learn more about you, to go get the book? Um, and if, you know, again, people want to reach out to you, what, what, what's the best place, Nick, to, to do that at? Sure. So the um, uh, my customer service consulting business is whatcustomerscrave.com, which is also the name of my latest book. That's available on Amazon. Uh, the audio book, which is they, they hired a great voice actor to, to do the audio book. I don't read books anymore because I don't have time, so I listen to them on airplanes. Uh, is on iTunes. It's on Amazon. It's on Kindle. It's on every platform in the world. Um, and that uh, the name of that book is whatcustomerscrave.com. Uh, my speaking site is simply Nick Webb with two with two Bs. N I C K webb.com and that kind of gives you a little background about my speaking work um, so that's it that's kind of the best way to and, uh, and anybody is always welcome to reach out I'm always glad to help people and send them in the right direction and my email is simply nick at nickweb.com yeah awesome and those watching and listening will make it really easy to just links will be right below that you can click whether you're watching or listening to this they'll be right below for you to do that so if you knowing what you know now Nick um, having all these just amazing life experiences and these 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 growth moments and you know all this stuff that you've experienced knowing everything that you know now at 58 if you could go back and back in time and and meet your younger self your let's say your 21 year old self or your 23 year old self when you got you know that first sold that first company and give yourself a couple pieces of advice knowing what you know now today what would those be I'll tell you, it's, it's surprising because I've had this sort of introspection recently. I guess it's part of existentialism. But I can, you know, put it to you this way. Uh, I've always thought I was a crazy, risky guy that I would just do nutty stuff that the average person wouldn't do. It turns out as I look back over the last 35 years, I think I slowed my success way down by not really truly being willing to expose myself to risk. Uh, and most people on the outside looking in would not agree with that, but it's true. We have to be really, really careful to realize. I just want to, I would characterize it this way. I would look Nick in the eyes and I would say, Nick, trust me on this. Do not fear taking smart risks. That's where your wealth is. And, I, you know, I, I elongated wealth so long because, uh, well, I mean, you know, I, I, I was, had, was worth millions in my early 20s, but... The, the point is, is that I, I, there's just so many opportunities that I could have and should have and would have jumped into if I wasn't chicken. And, and I, I always thought that I wasn't chicken, but I was. And, and that's the, the one piece of advice. The other thing is, is the second piece of advice is put a list together at the beginning of every month and write down the things you're not going to do. I spent so much time in my life focusing on stuff I was going to do that I forgot to think about things I shouldn't do. I'm not going to look at my emails during the day. I'm not going to take jobs with uh, clients that are tools. I'm not going to do projects that I can't deliver great value to the client for. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. Develop what you stand for and identify a list of things that you refuse to do because they're not consistent with your values and they're not consistent with your happiness and success. I think those two pieces of advice would have taken me a lot farther. Yeah, no, that's powerful words. So, um, yeah, no, I, I love it. So, um, I know you, you mentioned um, some sites that you go that you go to daily and reading for for a few minutes, but you know, being I mean, one you're an author, you know, right? So I'm sure some of it could be um, uh, your own due diligence, if you will, doing your own homework when you're out there reading and doing doing some research there. Um, but how important does your own personal self development play to your success? And what what do you what does that look like on a daily basis to you? Because I got to imagine with everything that you do, you got to stay. It's like Wayne Gretzky said, you don't skate to where the puck is going, or is, you skate to where it's going. Well, in your line of work, dude, you got to go to where it's going. 
you know, so you got to be way ahead of the curve. Right. My biggest fear is, is that somebody knows something more than me. So I do, a th I do my stairs. I have a, I have a huge, tall, uh, 50 foot ceilings in my home and I do my stairs for 30 minutes with, uh, and I, I try to ingest at least one audio book per week. And I try to do it on a combination of business skill sets and personal development skeps. I alternate between the two. Uh, I'm doing right now, I'm listening to The Miracle Morning, which I think is a really, I, you know, I've always get, got up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock. The other thing I do is I go to my, my jacuzzi at 4 a.m. every morning. I'm in my jacuzzi watching the sun come up. And that's the time where I spend a lot of time being thankful for the things I have, thinking about the cool things I want to accomplish that day. So I think, you know, developing these, these uh, you know, we tend to have a lot of life destructive habits. We need to ditch those and try to replace them with life affirming habits. Seems obvious. Very few of us really act upon that advice, and it seems to really, really work predictably. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I know that you do a lot of these interviews, you know, right? And, um, I mean, you're such a brilliant guy that, you know, it, it, sure there's so many topics and so many questions you never get asked, you know, that guys like me never even think to ask you. Is there ever, like, a question that in these interviews or, or any interviews that you ever do that you wish people would ask, but they never ask you? <laughs> I, that's a great question, actually. Um, you know, I, I think that we, uh, what's interesting to me is people tend to be very mechanical about things, right? Um, and they don't tend to be very metaphysical about things. And, I, and I, I'm always reluctant to talk in those metaphysical terms because they seem kind of wacky, right? But I will say in, in my life is that I know that uh, that all of this great stuff I talk about and all these amazing material things that materialize around me in terms of wealth and opportunities, they all seem to be based on Neville's work from the 1920s where when we can emotionalize the things that we want in our life, not think about it, but emotionalize the things that we want in our life, they tend to show up. And it could be a psychological dynamic or maybe it is some metaphysical thing, but it is interesting to me that nobody really goes beyond the, you know, sort of the pragmatic common questions. I've come to realize there's some voodoo going on here that I'm not aware of, but I know that my life is very, very different when I spend a lot of time in gratitude and a lot of time emotionalizing and visualizing what success is, it looks like in my life. That's when these, I, 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 th last year I did this experiment. It's going to sound corny. I pictured a white Freightliner truck loaded with everything that I wanted material, from a material perspective in that truck. And, I, and every day I would visualize where it was on its, on its trip to the West Coast, to California. I know it sounds nuts, but you know what? Every single thing that was in that truck was delivered to me within eight weeks of the time that it showed up in the, in the state of California. <laughs> was it dumb luck or did I already know that was going to happen? I don't know. But I do think that it's really worth thinking about that the mind, you know, Tesla said that we are going to discover that everything in life is about energy vibration. I know I'm sounding crazy, but it seems to be that there could be something to all that stuff. Yeah, and no, I love it. And I, 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 the vibrate, I mean, it's, it's one of those things, I know we don't know a lot about it yet, but, you know, when you study like the Great Pyramid, you know, they, I mean, they've, they've now discovered these vibration chambers, which the theory yeah. is that people would sit on there, they'd figure out their body's vibration, and they would actually heal them through aligning those vibrations, and it's you know much more advanced than, than we know or can understand yet, but I, I agree, I think there's a lot to that. When you talk about emotional, though, um, connection to, to your visions or your manifestation, because you got your, you know, your Think and Grow Rich books, which is, you know, just visualize, visualize uh, with that. What do you mean between emotional, or how do you go from just the, the mental and tap into that emotional with your manifestation? If you research all the great experts on this subject, and it's kind of an interest of mine, there's a, guy, very well, a very unknown author by the name of Kyle uh, Wesley Powell. And he is a, a really interesting guy that sort of talked a lot about all this stuff in sort of one body of work. But if you look at Neville's work, Neville says that it's not about visualizing what you want and it's not about you know thinking positive. It's really about being in the emotional state of the sort of wished come true, right? It's, it's in the emotional state of the dream being realized. What does it feel like to get in that brand new Porsche, 
uh, that $120,000 Porsche Cabriolet? What does it feel like? What's the wet? What is the the leather smell like? You know, what is it like to drive way, drive through Santa Barbara on Highway One in that amazing car? You know, what is it? You know, what is the weight of a Rolex watch? What does that feel like, right? And all of a sudden, the stuff just you know, the UPS comes and it's in your UPS yeah. box. <laughs> I got me, man. I, 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 you know, maybe I'm not smart enough to get it, but I do trust. In the genius of a lot of the uh, of the people that talk about this, I mean, from Jesus to Thoreau to Buddha to Taoism to every other body of knowledge, they're all basically saying the same thing. Again, I'm not an expert on this stuff, but it is interesting to me that people don't say, "Well, you know, a lot of people do what you do, Nick, but they don't seem to be doing that great at it." Help me understand how you've been able to create sustainable achievement, and I really think it has a lot to do with developing the discipline of expecting. You know, I expect things to happen with great, great authority. And I feel what they would look like in their real material. You know, as an innovator, when you think about it, go to Chicago, look around, the cars, the buildings, all of that stuff was just a set of neurons in somebody's head. And then through a series of physical manifestations, it turned into buildings and furniture and cars and everything you see, right? So everything that the man, a man can visualize, a man can create, we don't tend to do that much. And as a successful inventor, I can tell you that I've gotten really, really good. I invented one of the first wearable technologies 18 years ago, leveraging two-way pagers before there was a functional internet. And, uh, and now that same technology is being used and made a lot of money being made on it using now digital ubiquity associated with, you know, with wireless and, and uh, mobile technology. So it, it, it is interesting, and there's something that's worth researching and looking into that body of work, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I discovered that a few years ago, or well, a couple of years ago. I was meditating very deeply and manifesting very deeply, and then I was doing some reflection. I realized everything I've ever manifested came true, but then I realized I need to manifest much bigger. <laughs> yeah, right. That, you know, that's another good point is that I would – maybe the third thing I would, say, I would tell uh, my, my younger self is uh, – don't you know? I think it was Les Brand that said, "There's no, there's no magic in in smallness. There's only magic in boldness. You've got, as he says, you've got to be bold, right? And you've got to be bold because it's the boldness that provides the locomotion. And so it turns out it might be easier to do really, really big things because of the power of boldness than it is to do incremental things. I think that's true, and that's certainly been the case for me." Yeah. Well, and it sounds like too, you go, you take the time to go so deep in your manifestations that it exists in your subconscious. It may not be the reality in the conscious yet, but your, your body can't tell the difference, right? Right. And you know, look, I might just be lucky. I mean, all this whole thing, everything that's happened to me in 30 years might just be dumb luck. I, I could be wrong, right? I do a lot of stupid stuff all the time and I can't, and somehow I survive it. <laughs> so maybe this is dumb luck, but you know what? I don't think so. I, from observing other successful people, which has been something I read, I read uh, Earl Nightingale when I was 11 years old. In fact, I listened to a 45 record that my mom brought home. She worked at the Los Angeles Times and she got a copy of this record. And I listened to it hundreds of times until literally the grooves in the 45 record wouldn't allow it to play anymore. And from that moment, I knew that there was some body of work that you could follow to have predictable success. It turns out the recipe for success is a thing, just like any kind of formula, just like a medical diagnostic pathway, just like anything else we do. It's a body of research that has proven and predictable results. I've just followed that and it seems to work out every time. Yep, love it. So um, last question for because I know, I know we're going long on time. I know you're a really busy man, um, but but you, you, you filed you know, a lot of patents. You've had a lot of success with them. Um, for with those, because I'm sure, just like everything, we, we have a lot of successes and we have a lot of our failures or growth and learning experiences. If we have listeners that are looking, that have a great idea, but they, they know they need to protect it with a patent, do you, do you have any like um, you know quick tips? You know, because I'm sure there's they, you got to be careful there, right? To be able to protect yourself, protect your your property. <clears throat> Yeah, so look, I, I wrote a book called Invent Stuff that really sort of covers this. Um, number one is that ideas have zero value. They're, they're worth nothing. Um, and most inventors, especially amateur inventors, are under the erroneous impression that an idea has intrinsic value. It just doesn't. It's just potential value. So nobody wants your idea. Nobody's going to pay you for your idea. Nobody's going to license your idea. But there is a group of companies, lar and there are thousands of them, that prey on amateur inventors. So number one recommendation is 
never go to a 1-800 invent type company. They are not going to do anything for you. And you always want to check with your local federal trade or your uh, local uh, attorney general's office and the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office because there's lots of people that prey on amateur inventors because truthfully, most amateur inventors are hysterical. They think they've just invented an anti-gravity machine or something. It's just not that easy. If you want to make money on an idea, you've got to take the risk. Nobody's going to take it for you. And that's a lesson that most inventors never get. They, I have a dentist that's been calling me for 17 years trying to find somebody to invest into his toothbrush that is frankly may have been a good idea 17 years ago but it's been so over invented since then that is his idea is irrelevant he was waiting for somebody to make his idea successful successful innovators make their own ideas successful if you don't have the money to the best way to look at it is if you want to open a bakery you got to buy an oven you got to rent a building you got to hire people and maybe you'll be successful. Same thing is true with an innovation. It's just an idea, and you're the one that has to invest in it. And so that's the, that's the, the key. The other thing is, is that you know, out of the 3,000 patents that are issued each and every week in the US Patent Office, every week, 3,000, less than 2% of those products ever become successfully commercial. Not because they weren't cool, and not because they didn't do anything. It's because that the, 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 there wasn't enough people that cared. Uh, or the value of it wasn't differentiated enough to make it better than what already exists. Take mousetraps for an example. There's literally three or four thousand mousetrap patents, and I don't know how many mousetraps do you see. Maybe four or five. The bottom line is, is that we're catching mice just fine with the stuff we got that's dirt cheap and works every time, and they cost pennies. So the point that I make is, um, don't be hysterical with your innovation. Realize that you've got to fall out of love with your idea and look at it pragmatically, realize that if it's going to be successful, it's up to you, and most importantly, avoid the 1-800 innovation, get you rich companies because they're all frauds. Yep, love it, love it, powerful words. And those watching and listening, um, again, you guys, I end every podcast with this, but information without implementation is really just the start of delusion. Information is no longer power. It's taking action on that information that then creates power in your world. Nick shared so many just amazing, brilliant pieces of information with you guys. Take something that you learned today, go out there and apply it into your life to create that power inside your life that you know you want and deserve. Also, go get Nick's uh, uh, books below. Check out his website. All those links will be below. And Nick, man, I know how busy you are, and it's truly, truly a massive honor to have you on the show. I really appreciate it, my friend. No, listen, it was an honor. I appreciate it. It was fun. Yeah, all right, you guys. Well, thank you so much, and we will see you next time.